as you know, One Young World, we're very passionate about any and every organization who are doing things with brilliant young people and brilliant young leaders. And we've always wanted One Young World to be an open platform for them. Um, and anybody who is doing work and brilliant work with the best young leaders in the world, we would love to have here at One Young World. So we convene as many organizations as we can who are working to promote youth issues and promote leadership amongst young people. Now our next speaker is a Canadian social entrepreneur who's passionate about the power of young people to collectively change the world. Um, we, we think that our One Young World videos are pretty good, but his We, oh, Day, <laughs> his, his we Day videos, we have video envy every time we see his, <laughs> his We Day videos. So please welcome the founder of me to we and We Day, returning to One Young World for the second time, Mark Kielberger. So good afternoon, One Young World. For those of you looking for seats, come on in. It's a pleasure to be here. Can I give a shout out to the Canadians in the house? Where do I find our Canadians? It's an honor to be here among all of you, but of course, all of our Canadian friends. And I'm so thrilled that One Young World is hosted here in Canada for the very first time. My job here today is I want to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Myself and my younger brother, Craig, we're Canadian proudly. We've created an international organization dedicated to empowerment, empowering young people at home and abroad. And I want to share with you some lessons that we have learned along the way, some lessons of social change. And so before I begin, not only do I want to say thank you to David and to Kate, I really want to say thank you to all of you because we know how hard it is to get here. Not just to get here, but to truly be here, to represent our generation. So on that note, I want to share with you first a story, it's something called the Minga philosophy. And it's set here in one of the communities we work internationally in Ecuador. Now we build schools all around the world, we work internationally, we work at home, we work abroad. But internationally, we work in eight countries, including in Ecuador, where we help young people have the chance to go to school. Now, I'll never forget the first time we built this school. It's perhaps my favorite school out of the thousand that we've built. And this school is very exciting because we were building our school and building our school and building our school, and we had all our supplies going up on the back of mules, on the back of donkeys, up tiny, windy mountain paths in order to get the supplies up. There's no roads. And the situation was this. It was peak harvest season. So all the food was coming off. Of course, everybody was harvesting their food and on the back of donkeys in the opposite direction, on tiny, windy mountain paths. And in the middle of nowhere, we were trying to build a school, in the middle of nowhere, in the Andes Mountains, there was a traffic jam of donkeys. These things happen, the perils of international development. And so we didn't know what to do. We wanted to make sure the food wasn't going to rot, so we sent the, the food down, and, and we had an opportunity not to, of course, finish our school because the supplies weren't going to reach it in time. So we went to the woman of the community, the eldest woman, the chief, and we explained what happened. She said, no problem. We said, no, man, big problem. We're not going to finish the school. She said, no problem. She said, I will call a Minga. She said, I'll call a Minga. And she walked out of her hut overlooking her gorge, and she said in her loudest possible voice, she said, tomorrow there will be a Minga. And it reverberated because it was there. It was Minga, 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 Minga. <laughs> and she came back and she said, see, no problem. And we're like, okay. So we brought our young people together, and we said, we don't know what to do. She called a Minga. It was super awkward. We're not sure what to acknowledge here. So we said, we better work all night. And we worked all night long, a group of young Canadians thinking that we weren't going to finish the school. But at 6 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, because we were up, the incredible majestic sunrise started to come up over the Andes Mountains, and we saw all these people started to come. They heard this word, this term Minga. Even though there aren't cell phones, everybody said, there'll be a Minga tomorrow. There'll be a Minga tomorrow. There'll be a Minga tomorrow. And people left their fields in peak harvest season. People left their fields in peak harvest season, even though they weren't going to benefit from the school themselves because they live so far away. Many walked all night long. And they came and they finished the school and they had a big celebration and poof, they all left. They all left. And we were totally dumbfounded. And we went to the woman and this time we had our head bowed and we were like, ma'am, what did you do? She said, I, I called a Minga. We're like, we know. What's a Minga? 
She said, oh, uh, Aminga, in my language, in Quechuan, is the coming together of people to work for the benefit of all. And we said, wow, the coming together of people to work for the benefit of all. She said, oh, yes, the coming together of people to work for the benefit of all. She said, so what's the word in your language? And we said, we'll be right back. So we grabbed our group of young Canadians. We're like, well, what's the word? It's kind of like volunteerism, but not really, because you could do that alone. It's kind of like barn raising, but how much barn raising is in downtown Ottawa anymore? She was getting agitated. She's like, what's the word? We're like, it's kind of like a riot for good. She's still probably calling it a riot for good. The reason I share that story with you is this is a minga. What David and Kate and One Young World and all of you are participating, this is the closest thing I could think of, of the true embodiment of what this woman means. This truly is a minga. So you should be so proud to be here. So as we embark on this journey, I want to share with you very quickly four lessons that we have learned. I'm then going to introduce you to one of my colleagues who's going to come up and inspire you. The first lesson is basic. Anybody can change the world. You might Mark, say, I already know that. But I really want you to believe in it. I want you to believe in it. Very quickly, the story that why we are here, not just why I'm here, but why I'm here today, is because of this photo, this young boy from Pakistan named Iqbal Masih. Very quickly, his story is my brother at the age of 12 was looking for the comic section of our local newspaper. Instead of seeing a comic section, he saw the story of another 12-year-old boy. Iqbal's story, very quickly, was at the age of four, the parents in Pakistan took out a debt called a peshi debt and couldn't afford to pay the debt off and they used him as collateral. And so he went off with a man and ended up working and being shackled to carpet looms for seven days a week, 12 hours a day. He had no opportunity to go to school. At the age of 10, he was lucky. He was able to run away. They forgot to chain him down one day. And he got hooked up with a local human rights organization. And the thing about Iqbal, he was very soft-spoken, but very well-spoken. He started to go from town to town, to village to village, to educate other parents why they shouldn't sell their kids. My brother kept on reading the article at the age of 12. He got something called the Reebok Human Rights Award in Boston, and he gave this incredible speech. He held a carpet tool in one hand, and he held a pencil in the other. And he spoke of freedom, the freedom for kids to go to school. At the age of 12, my brother kept on reading, finally reunited back with his family, so happy to be home, riding his bike with his cousin. And the people who owned the carpet factory where he used to work, came out of nowhere, and they shot, and they killed him. And they killed him because he was impacting global carpet sales. So my brother, at the age of 12, took, he's the one in the blue, took this article to a seventh grade class, said, who wants to help? One hand went up, another hand went up, another hand went up. 11 others plus him said, you know what, we're going to do something, we're going to start a club, what's the name of the club? Looked around, there were 11 plus him, they were all 12 years old, they said, we're going to call the club the group of 12 12 year olds. <laughs> and then two weeks later, one of them turned 13. <laughs> but the point being is this, is he wanted to make a difference. He asked me for my help a week later, I said, sure, it's been 20 years now. And it's been amazing to see that group of 12 12 year olds, this is our first thing that we wanted to do, this is our local town festival, we wanted to build one school. We wanted to build one school, we've now built a thousand, but we've now wanted to build that first school. And now we've gone from that to this. These amazing events that we have <laughs> called We Days. It's kind of like One Young World for really young people so they can one day be in this room. And we do 16 of these events all around the world, 16 of them, 20,000 kids from 1,000 schools every year. And we celebrate social change. Our organization is now called We, it's the We Movement. We're very proud of it. And we have a chance to share and to engage and to celebrate. And welcome to the power of We. So we're very passionate. So anybody can change the world, lesson number one. Lesson number two is giving people the dignity not to need your help anymore. We call it a hand up, not a handout. A hand up, not a handout. We know many of you are philanthropic. Many of you will start social enterprises if you haven't already. Many of you are in commerce or business, or perhaps you will be one day soon. So let me tell you why this is so important. I want to take you internationally, this case, to our We Villages model. We work in eight countries around the world. We have, gosh, about 200,000 kids we've educated, 1,000 schools we've built all around the world. We take old schools like this, and old schools like this, 
And these are the lucky few that actually get to go to school, of course, and if you're not under a tree. And we have an opportunity, through the help of community and engagement and 12,000 schools here in North America that fundraise for this, to have a chance to build new schools and new school rooms and classrooms and communities all around providing education. Young people getting engaged to help other young people on college campuses and elementary schools and secondary schools, making sure that we can create an opportunity to engage together. So why is this relevant? Well, let me share with you why. Okay, next slide, please, about education. Here's the thing, is we started building schools, and we built schools, and we built schools, and we built schools, and the challenge was this, and many of you probably already know this. Boys were going to the school, and the girls weren't present. So we went to the community, like we always do, and we said, what's up, where are the girls? And they said, nobody has ever asked us that question before. We said, what do you mean? They say, people come, and they want to make a difference, and they want to help, and then they leave, and they never ask our opinion. We said, well, of course, that's ridiculous. Where are the girls? And they said, they're getting water. Interestingly enough, I had the privilege of going to Harvard on scholarship, and I learned under an amazing development economist named Jeffrey Sachs, and all the statistics show in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number one reason why girls don't go to school, in Sub-Saharan Africa at least, isn't because there's no schools, it's because they often have to get water for their village, especially if they live in rural areas. So we said, what do we need to do? They said, can you bring water to the schools? We said, of course. So all our schools have water, so girls go to school and they go home with a bucket of water and an education. So cool. So we went to the community and we said, what else do we need to do? And they said, can you make sure that the kids have enough food because they only get tea in the morning? We said, absolutely. So all the schools have schools, water, and a community garden or a school garden nonetheless. All the schools also have access to health care. But most importantly, all, not only the schools are empowered, the women of the community are empowered because we ensure, and this is so important, we ensure that the mothers are empowered so they can afford to send their kids to school in the first place. So they can afford to send their kids to school in the first place. Because you can build schools, you can have water, you can have health, you can have all these great things. But if your economic fundamentals aren't right, it's not going to work. Simple macro and microeconomics 101. So we empower the women, we give them financial literacy, we give them microcredit, like those skills. We have things like the Rafiki friend chains, which are on your seats, which I'll share with you in a minute. These are mechanisms of economic empowerment. So the women don't have the opportunity to get this for free. They spend two cents on the water jug, two dollars when their kid is sick. But you know what? They can afford it. Because that's what this is all about. Giving people the dignity so they don't need your help anymore. So I want to share with you now the second lesson. This critical lesson, if you want to change the world, a hand up, not a handout. Let's do go together to We Villages. <laughs> lesson number one, anybody can change the world. Lesson number two, a hand up, not a handout. Lesson number three, using social enterprise to solve critical issues. We have about 500 full-time team members that work with us here in Canada internationally. To give you a sense, we received 24,000 applications last year for 240 spots. It's three times harder to get a job now at WE than it is to get into Harvard. The reason I share that with you, for a very specific reason, is that we take business graduates more than more and more because international development graduates, we absolutely love. Poli sci, love everybody we love, but we need to make sure that you have business skills. And so whether you're a business graduate, we want to say thank you. If you're a political science graduate or you're in psychology or whatever, take that stats course. Take the math course. Take the marketing course. We need well-rounded people who understand the fundamentals. It's so critical. So for us, the person that taught us this in our me-to-we line, our me-to-we division of how the fact that business truly can change the world is this fine gentleman right here. I know he's no uh, stranger to One Young World. He's very active with our organization. He's an amazing person. Of course, Sir Richard Branson. And the reason I share this with you is that I want to have a chance for you to feel the impact of this. As I mentioned, on all of your chairs is something called a Rafiki friend chain. Rafiki means friend in Swahili, the local language in Kenya, where we actually have a chance to employ 1,500 full-time women who bead these, including these amazing bracelets that can be used in a multitude of different ways, and also artisan's goods that are now sold in 12,000 retail locations in North America. 12,000 doors. These women make four times as much money as their men. Four times as much money as their men. And you see them, they're like, look at my goat. I now have a latrine. I now can send my girl to school. It's the fundamentals of business meeting social change, business and social change together. It's a powerful format. These women are now economically empowered because of this. And I want you to wear this. I want you to go home and I want you to tell the story of these women.
Very quickly, on the back of your uh, packaging, there's a code. You actually can go on our website, we.org, and actually enter in the code and actually see where it was made. Very cool. Transparency, accountability, coming together to change the world. Our last lesson is this, make it cool to care. We talked about anybody can change the world. We talked about hand up, not a handout, using business skills to solve social problems. And finally, make it cool to care. Changing the world is the single coolest thing you can do. And of course, this is a demonstration of that. Having people on this stage today, having the opportunity to share with you is so important. But for so many young people, they don't understand this. And it is our job as our generation to go back and inspire them to make sure that this is not only possible, but it's also cool. And this is something we're very passionate about, especially for the younger generation, who one day will be here at One Young World. And it's what we do called We Day. We do 16 of these events all around the world. We bring amazing people together to celebrate social change all throughout Canada, throughout the United States and growing, and having the opportunity to have people like Kermit the Frog and Zoe Deschanel, which is always fun. Our Prime Minister is a big uh, engaging person. Prince Harry, Malala, and uh, President Sirleaf, and many, many others who have come and participating. And for our Canadians, this fine gentleman is going to be at We Day Toronto, which we're very excited about. But the reason I share this is that we need to make change in the world so socially possible and acceptable. And I need you to go home to your communities and mentor a young person who one day can be at One Young World and tell them, keep it up, keep doing what you're doing, and you're so cool for doing it. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you to David and to Kate. One day, the next generation will be in these seats. And we're so proud to be a small part of that process. And we're so proud that you're going to go back and make it cool to care. One of the people who has been on the We Day stage, who's one of our amazing ambassadors, Canadians, you know and you love him. He's an amazing hero, and he recently climbed Mount Kilimanjaro on his hands. Can you please give it up for Mr. Spencer West? Thank you, awesome. Thank you sir. Wow, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's very nice. Thank you. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's very nice, thank you. <laughs> please have a seat, please have a seat. <laughs> wow, that was really nice, thank you, and thanks, Mark. Um, what I wanted to do is just share a little bit about my journey and how I found this organization, WE, and how those lessons that Mark just told you played out in my life specifically and brought me to literally be here in front of you today. So to just start by addressing the elephant in the room, we'll get the awkwardness out of the way. No, your eyes aren't deceiving you. These are new glasses. <laughs> they actually are, too. And uh, obviously, I don't have any legs. I was born with legs, but I was born with a genetic disease that caused the muscles in my legs not to work. So at the age of two, they were removed at the knee in hopes that I could use artificial legs and get around that way. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. So then at the age of five, they were removed just below my pelvis, which is basically what you see now. Now, after my surgeries, my family and I were told by the doctors that I would never sit up on myself, that I would never walk by myself, and that I probably wouldn't be a functioning member of society. But my family and I refused to believe that. So we set out to prove to only ourselves, but the rest of the world, that I could be just like everybody else. Now, believe it or not, me not having legs hasn't been the biggest challenge that I've faced. For me, the biggest challenge that I faced was figuring out not only how I find happiness, but how do I find purpose, and how do I find a job that not only provides income, but that makes the world a better place at the same time. And for a long time, I didn't know how to find that. And I'm originally from the United States, and I grew up in the state of Wyoming. And I was working in corporate America after I finished college. And I had everything that society where I grew up told me that I needed. I had money, I had a car, I had my best friend and I rented a house with a pool in the backyard. This is my family, by the way. Aren't they cute? But I also had a, a pool in my backyard. We were renting, but we still had a pool out of uh, all of our friends being in our mid-20s and having an, our own pool in our own backyard was a big deal. But even though I had all of these things, they didn't make me happy. And I thought, did I do something wrong? Have I, have I failed? And it was eight years ago that a good friend of mine called who knew I'd been struggling and invited me to go on a Me Too We volunteer trip to Kenya to help build a school. And at first I was like, what? I told my friend, I said, standing on my hands, I'm two foot seven inches tall. I'm pretty sure that's a snack to half the animals in Kenya. <laughs> and 
and I don't want to be Meals on Wheels, thank you. <laughs> but I realized that if I was truly going to start a new journey, I had to step outside my comfort zone and take a risk. So in March of 2008, I went to Kenya. And although it's cliche, it's the best way I know how to describe my journey. It truly was life-changing. I fell in love with the scenery. I fell in love with the sunsets. And more specifically, I fell in love with the people. Now, while I was there, I learned about Mark, and I learned about Craig, and I got to see firsthand how We Villages was literally changing these people's lives. I got to walk with the girls and collect water with them and carry it back a day in the life. We helped build a school and took that school that you saw before, you know, the, that Mark mentioned. I learned about We Villages, and, and we, we changed that school from this to this, which was pretty amazing. I saw the clean water projects. I learned about the alternative income. And I saw how these community members were lifting themselves out of poverty. Now, all of this was really amazing, but the moment that changed everything for me is when we arrived at one of the new schools. All these kids came running out. We sat in the grass. After I told them my entire story, a young girl raised her hand, and she looked at me, and she said that she didn't know something like this, meaning the loss of my legs, could happen to white people, too. And for me, that one phrase changed my entire journey and helped me recognize how I could use my story to empower other people to look at challenges differently, also get involved with something they were passionate about, and give back at the same time. That one trip, I realized that I could change the world, and I also realized that I could give a handout and not a hand up by working for this organization. So I came back to North America, I applied for a job. Literally within three months, I had packed up my entire life and moved to Toronto, Canada to be an ambassador for this incredible organization that I'm so grateful for. And I actually work on the me-to-we side of things, so I work on the business side of things, which is really important to me. Now, what's really great, and I've been so grateful for, is halfway through my journey, I was feeling guilty because I was telling folks like you guys, you know, you need to get out there and you need to get involved with the things that you care about, but I was just talking about it. And this organization provided the space for me to not just talk about it, but to also do it. And so four years ago, my buddies and I came up with this campaign called Redefine Possible, where our goal was to climb the largest mountain in Africa and raise a half a million dollars for clean water at the time for East Africa, who was facing one of the largest droughts they've seen in over 60 years. And in June of 2012, we set out to do just that. Now, the hope was that I would do half on my hands and half in my wheelchair, but when we got to Kilimanjaro, I was doing way more on my hands than we ever anticipated. And I'm so grateful that my two best friends said they would join me because I needed their help. They were great at saying encouraging words like just a few more steps, keep going. They would literally carry me above their head. When my arms needed a bit of a break, they would help push me in my chair. Now, I knew climbing to the top of the largest mountain in Africa, I was going to need help. But what I didn't anticipate is that on summit day, the roles would be reversed. And my buddies would need my help. Because around 18,000 feet, they got hit with a massive altitude sickness, and I was in that small percentage of people where it didn't bother me at all. We joke it's because of my height, but I don't actually know if that's real. <laughs> I literally watched my support system crumble to their knees before me. And this was the first time in my entire life where I wished that I had legs that day. Because if I had legs now, I could be the one to carry my friends, like they had carried me. But I don't have legs, so instead I did what my parents taught me, and that was to focus on the things that I could do. My friends kept saying, it's inspiring to watch you walk, and I thought, if that's all that I can do, then I will do that to the best of my ability. I stood in between my two best friends, and I said, this journey started with the three of us, and it's gonna end with the three of us. And, the and foot over foot, we made it to the top. And we celebrated because we'd reached well over our goal, which provided clean water to 12,500 people for life. I've gone on to do some other campaigns. We walk between two cities in Canada, 300 kilometers, to raise awareness about how far women and girls have to walk to collect water every single day. The following year, I did a bus tour across Canada, thanking all the incredible Canadians here that were working so hard to make the world a better place. And I even got to prove that it is really cool to care and give back, because the year after that, I got to go on tour with my really good friend, Demi Lovato, and open for her concerts every single night on her world tour to talk about this message and to bring this to her audience as well proving that it is cool to care and that it's so important. So in the words of one of my favorite authors, which I think will sum up the work you have to do after here, based on all those lessons that we've learned from myself and Mark, is that today, or this weekend, but today for this is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. And that's thanks to Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your time.